The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain Chapter twenty eight The Sacrifice Meantime Miles was growing sufficiently tired of confinement and inaction, but now his trial came on to his great gratification, and he thought he could welcome any sentence provided a further imprisonment should not be part of it. But he was mistaken about that. He was in a fine fury when he found himself described as a sturdy vagabond, and sentenced to sit two hours in the pillory for bearing that character and for assaulting the master of Hendon Hall. His pretensions as to brothership with his prosecutor, and rightful heirship to the Hendon honours and estates, were left contemptuously unnoticed, as being not even worth examination. He raged and threatened on his way to punishment, but it did no good. He was snatched roughly along by the officers, and got an occasional cuff, besides, for his unreverent conduct. The king could not pierce through the rabble that swarmed behind, so he was obliged to follow in the rear, remote from his good friend and servant. The king had been nearly condemned to the stocks himself for being in such bad company, but had been let off with a lecture and a warning in consideration of his youth. When the crowd at last halted, he flitted feverishly from point to point around its outer rim, hunting a place to get through, and at last, after a deal of difficulty and delay, succeeded. There sat his poor henchman in the degrading stocks, the sport and butt of a dirty mob, he the body-servant of the King of England. Edward had heard the sentence pronounced, but he had not realized the half that it meant. His anger began to rise as the sense of this new indignity which had been put upon him sank home. It jumped to summer heat the next moment, when he saw an egg sail through the air and crush itself against Hendon's cheek, and heard the crowd roar its enjoyment of the episode. He sprang across the open circle and confronted the officer in charge, crying, "'For shame! This is my servant! Set him free! I am the—' "'Oh, peace!' exclaimed Hendon, in a panic. "'Thou destroy thyself! Mind him not, officer, he is mad. Give thyself no trouble as to the matter of minding him, good man. I have small mind to mind him, but as to teaching him somewhat, to that I am well inclined.' He turned to his subordinate, and said, "'Give the little fool a taste or two of the lash to mend his manners.' "'Half a dozen will better serve his turn,' suggested Sir Hugh, who had ridden up a moment before, to take a passing glance at the proceedings. The king was seized. He did not even struggle, so paralyzed was he with the mere thought of the monstrous outrage that was proposed to be inflicted upon his sacred person. History was already defiled with the record of the scourging of an English king with whips. It was an intolerable reflection that he must furnish a duplicate of that shameful page. He was in the toils. There was no help for him. He must either take this punishment or beg for its remission. Hard conditions. He would take the stripes. A king might do that, but a king could not beg. But meantime Miles Hendon was resolving the difficulty. "'Let the child go,' said he. "'Ye heartless dogs, do you, do you not see how young and frail he is? Let him go. I will take his lashes.' "'Marry, a good thought, and thanks for it,' said Sir Hugh, his face lighting with sardonic satisfaction. "'Let the little beggar go, and give this fellow a dozen in his place, an honest dozen, well laid on.' The king was in the act of entering a fierce protest, but Sir Hugh silenced him with a potent remark. "'Yes, speak up, do, and free thy mind. Only mark ye, that for each word you utter he shall get six strokes the more.' Hendon was removed from the stocks, and his back laid bare, and whilst the lash was applied the poor little king turned away his face, and allowed unroyal tears to channel his cheeks unchecked. "'Ah, oh, brave good heart!' he said to himself. "'This loyal deed shall never perish out of my memory. I will not forget it, and neither shall they,' he added with passion. Whilst he mused, his appreciation of Hendon's magnanimous conduct grew to greater and still greater dimensions in his mind, and so also did his gratefulness for it. Presently he said to himself, "'Who saves his prince from wounds and possible death, and this he did for me, performs high service, but it is little, it is nothing, oh, less than nothing, went his way against the act of him who saves his prince from shame. Hendon made no outcry under the scourge, but bore the heavy blows with soldierly fortitude. This, together with his redeeming the boy by taking his stripes for him, compelled the respect of even that forlorn and degraded mob that was gathered there, and its jibes and hootings died away 
and no sound remained but the sound of the falling blows. The stillness that pervaded the place, when Hendon found himself once more in the stocks, was in strong contrast with the insulting clamour which had prevailed there so little a while before. The king came softly to Hendon's side, and whispered in his ear, "'Kings cannot ennoble thee, thou good, great soul, for one who is higher than kings hath done that for thee. But a king can confirm thy nobility to men.' He picked up the scourge from the ground touched Hendon's bleeding soldiers lightly with it, and whispered, "'Edward of England dubs thee Earl!' Hendon was touched. The water welled to his eyes, yet at the same time the grisly humour of the situation and circumstances so undermined his gravity that it was all he could do to keep some sign of his inward mirth from showing outside. To be suddenly hoisted, naked and gory, from the common stocks to the alpine altitude and splendour of an earldom, seemed to him the last possibility in the line of the grotesque. He said to himself, "'Now am I finally tinselled indeed. The spectre knight of the kingdom of dreams and shadows is become a spectre earl. A dizzy flight for a callow wing, and this go on I shall presently be hung like a very maypole with fantastic gods and make-believe honours but I shall value them, all valueless as they are, for the love that doth bestow them. Better these poor mock dignities of mine, that come unasked, from a clean hand and a right spirit, than real ones bought by servility from grudging an interested power." The dreaded Sir Hugh wheeled his horse about, and, as he spurred away, the living wall divided silently to let him pass, and as silently closed together again, and so remained. Nobody went so far as to venture a remark in favour of the prisoner, or in compliment to him, but no matter. The absence of abuse was a sufficient homage in itself. A latecomer who was not posted as to the present circumstances, and who delivered a sneer at the impostor, and was in the act of following it with a dead cat, was promptly knocked down and kicked out, without any words, and then the deep quiet resumed sway once more. End of chapter 28 Chapter Twenty Nine, To London. When Hendon's term of service in the stocks was finished, he was released and ordered to quit the region and come back no more. His sword was restored to him, and also his mule and his donkey. He mounted and rode off, followed by the king. The crowd opened with quiet respectfulness to let them pass, and then dispersing when they were gone. Hendon was soon absorbed in thought. There were questions of high import to be answered. What should he do? Whither should he go? Powerful help must be found somewhere, or he must relinquish his inheritance and remain under the imputation of being an impostor besides. Where could he hope to find this powerful help? Where, indeed? It was a naughty question. By and by a thought occurred to him which pointed to a possibility, the slenderest of slender possibilities, certainly, but still worth considering, for lack of any other that promised anything at all. He remembered what old Andrews had said about the young king's goodness, and his generous championship of the wronged and unfortunate. Why not go and try to get speech of him, and beg for justice? Ah, yes! But could so fantastic a pauper get admission to the august presence of a monarch? Never mind. Let that matter take care of itself. It was a bridge that would not need to be crossed till he should come to it. He was an old campaigner, and used to inventing shifts and expedients. No doubt he would be able to find a way. Yes, he would strike for the capital. Maybe his father's old friend Sir Humphrey Marlowe would help him. Good old Sir Humphrey, head lieutenant of the late King's kitchen, or stables, or something. Miles could not remember just what or which. Now that he had something to turn his energies to, a distinctly defined object to accomplish, the fog of humiliation and depression which had settled down upon his spirits lifted and blew away, and he raised his head and looked about him. He was surprised to see how far he had come. The village was away behind him. The king was jogging along in his wake, with his head bowed, for he too was deep in plans and thinkings. A sorrowful misgiving clouded Hendon's new-born cheerfulness. Would the boy be willing to go again to a city where, during all his brief life, he had never known anything but ill-usage and pinching want? But the question must be asked. It could not be avoided. So Hendon reined up and called out, I had forgotten to inquire whither we are bound. Thy commands, my liege. To London. 
Hendon moved on again, mightily contented with the answer, but astounded at it, too. The whole journey was made without an adventure of importance, but it ended with one. About ten o'clock on the night of the 19th of February, they stepped upon London Bridge, in the midst of a writhing, struggling jam of howling and hurraying people, whose beer-jolly faces stood out strongly in the glare from manifold torches, and at that instant the decaying head of some former duke or other grandee tumbled down between them, striking Hendon on the elbow, and then bounding off among the hurrying confusion of feet. So evanescent and unstable are men's works in this world. The late good king is but three weeks dead and three days in his grave, and already the adornments which he took such pains to select from prominent people for his noble bridge are falling. A citizen stumbled over that head, and drove his own head into the back of somebody in front of him, who turned and knocked down the first person that came handy, and was promptly laid out himself by that person's friend. It was the right, ripe time for a free fight, for the festivities of the morrow, Coronation Day, were already beginning. Everybody was full of strong drink and patriotism. Within five minutes the free fight was occupying a good deal of ground. Within ten or twelve it covered an acre or so, and was become a riot. By this time Hendon and the King were hopelessly separated from each other, and lost in the rush and turmoil of the roaring masses of humanity. And so we leave them. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 Tom's Progress Whilst the true king wandered about the land, poorly clad, poorly fed, cuffed and derided by tramps one while, herding with thieves and murderers in a jail another, and called idiot and impostor by all impartially, the mock king, Tom Canty, enjoyed a quite different experience. When we saw him last, royalty was just beginning to have a bright side for him. This bright side went on brightening more and more every day. In a very little while it was become almost all sunshine and delightfulness. He lost his fears, his misgivings faded out and died, his embarrassments departed, and gave place to an easy and confident bearing. He worked the whipping-boy mind to ever-increasing profit. He ordered my Lady Elizabeth and my Lady Jane Grey into his presence when he wanted to play or talk, and dismissed them when he was done with them, with the air of one familiarly accustomed to such performances. It no longer confused him to have these lofty personages kiss his hand at parting. He came to enjoy being conducted to bed in state, at night, and dressed with intricate and solemn ceremony in the morning. It came to be a proud pleasure to march to dinner attended by a glittering procession of officers of state and gentlemen-at-arms, insomuch, indeed, that he doubled his guard of gentlemen-at-arms, and made them a hundred. He liked to hear the bugles sounding down the long corridors, and the distant voices responding, "'Way for the King!' He even learned to enjoy sitting in throne state in council, and seeming to be something more than the Lord Protector's mouthpiece. He liked to receive great ambassadors and their gorgeous trains, and listen to the affectionate messages they brought from illustrious monarchs who called him brother. Oh, happy Tom Canty, late of Ophel Court! He enjoyed his splendid clothes, and ordered more. He found his four hundred servants too few for his proper grandeur, and troubled them. The adulation and salaaming courtiers came to be sweet music to his ears. He remained kind and gentle, and a sturdy and determined champion of all that were oppressed, and he made tireless war upon unjust laws. Yet, upon occasion, being offended, he could turn upon an earl, or even a duke, and give him a look that would make him tremble. Once, when his royal sister, the grimly holy lady Mary, set herself to reason with him against the wisdom of his course in pardoning so many people who would otherwise be jailed or hanged or burned, and reminded him that their august late father's prisons had sometimes contained as high as sixty thousand convicts at one time, and that during his admirable reign he had delivered seventy-two thousand thieves and robbers over to death by the executioner. Footnote. Hume's England. End of footnote. The boy was filled with generous indignation, and commanded her to go to her closet and beseech God to take away the stone that was in her breast, and give her a human heart. Did Tom Canty never feel troubled about the poor little rightful prince who had treated him so kindly, and flown out with such hot zeal, to avenge him upon the insolent sentinel at the palace gate? Yes, his first royal days and nights were pretty well sprinkled with painful thoughts about the lost prince, and with sincere longings for his return and happy restoration to his native rights and splendours. 
But as time wore on and the prince did not come, Tom's mind became more and more occupied with his new and enchanting experiences, and by little and little the vanished monarch faded almost out of his thoughts. And finally, when he did intrude upon them at intervals, he was become an unwelcome spectre, for he made Tom feel guilty and ashamed. Tom's poor mother and sisters travelled the same road out of his mind. At first he pined for them, sorrowed for them, longed to see them, but later the thought of their coming some day in their rags and dirt, and betraying him with their kisses, and pulling him down from his lofty place, and dragging him back to punery and degradation and the slums, made him shudder. At last they ceased to trouble his thoughts, almost wholly, and he was content, even glad, for whenever their mournful and accusing faces did rise before him now, they made him feel more despicable than the worms that crawl. At midnight of the 19th of February, Tom Canty was sinking to sleep in his rich bed in the palace, guarded by his loyal vassals and surrounded by the pomps of royalty, a happy boy, for to-morrow was the day appointed for his solemn crowning as King of England. At that same hour Edward, the true king, hungry and thirsty, soiled and draggled, worn with travel and clothed in rags and shreds, his share of the results of the riot, was wedged in among a crowd of people who were watching, with deep interest, certain hurrying gangs of workmen who streamed in and out of Westminster Abbey, busy as ants. They were making the last preparations for the royal coronation. End of chapter 30